Madeira Peggy. coming to Mumbai 
I've never been here before, and playing a charity game for the Lata Congestion Cancer Hospital, in aid of, in aid of, the, of the cancer hospital. And it was a, a ragtag bunch of former and current Sri Lankan players playing against them in the inside. So we played at a, a rabbit. We started the game, and it's a charity game, about, I don't know, 25,000 people were already there. India batted first. Sachin comes out to bat, opening, and stop, chip, stop, chip, starts all around the ground. I'm this young kid, I'm looking at what, what the hell is going on here. It never happens in Sri Lanka. Uh, and this, this deafening noise, Sachin got out, got out I think, in the, the second over. I looked around, about 20,000 had left. <laughs> <laughs> so it really confused me. You know, what's this amazing connection that, that India has? And then I um, I went down to a shop with Murali the next day, and we had an armed guard, two armed guards following us again. In Sri Lanka, when you're on your own time, you don't have bodyguards or anything like that. You just go do whatever you want to do, come back. When we stole and Murray was looking for, for something to buy. And then about 20 minutes in, they started closing the shutters down. So I said, now Murray, the shop's closed, she's going to go. So I went and told the manager, don't worry, we're leaving. And he said, no, 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 it's okay, you're fine, it's okay. So I said, why are you closing the shutters? No, no, we have a, a small crowd outside, they come to see Murray. And I said, oh, when I took a look, I reckon another 300 people there asking for Murray. So, <laughs> so, so this, for a first time cricketer in India, was was unbelievable. But every year since I've come, my children were born in 2009, and their first international trip was to India. And at nine months old, we went to Dharamsala, we went all the way here. And every year that I come back, and I've seen how they play color cricket here, how fanatical their support is for cricket, and I understand that this is a very special country in terms of now where the, 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 the sport that originated far away from these shows have now come here to call it home. So I think that's something that India can be very, very proud of. And for us, really, it's a very special country. And both of you have given us such wonderful cricketing moments. We have any highlights our minds when we think of you. Um, Kumar just spoke about Brabant Stadium. You had a, um, a wonderful stint at Brabant versus uh, the West Indies where you took five catches. Was that the highlight or was it the easy run out? We always want, I want to hear it from you. Sure, I, th I think. The highest point of your career, your most memorable. Well, I mean, for you. The, the crazy thing is that. The Inzi run-up was in 1992. That particular day was in Bradmore Stadium in 1993. So yes, my career carried on until 2003. And sadly, those were the two highlights. So I burst onto the scene very easily or very early and I just kind of fizzled out. But uh, be that as it may, it was, I think that obviously the Inter World Cup situation in 1992, I had been selected in South Africa. And we had 27 years of sport in isolation. We just had our democratic elections yesterday, I know it's still election time in India, so you'd understand the process that's been going on. In South Africa, we just had our elections, I think for the fourth time since Nelson Mandela was the first democratic president. So in 27 years of sporting isolation, we were invited back to the Cricket World Cup, thanks to the generosity firstly of the Indian Cricket Board, the ECCI, who invited us, even though we were not yet fully democratic in South Africa. So the 92 World Cup, we were told that as a South African cricket team, we were not yet representative. We had one, um, Omar Henry, a left arm spinner, the only non-white player in our squad. And they also ran a referendum. They had a referendum in South Africa. And the referendum was basically, they were talking about unbanning the ANC and releasing Nelson Mandela in order to change, make a transition from the, the apartheid regime to a democratic country. And the referendum was all about, do we stay Basically, no, do we stay as an apartheid regime, or yes, do we then go on and become a democracy? And, and I think that the, the proudest moment of my life was that, because we were told that during that World Cup, when the referendum was taking place, was that if the referendum was no, and then decided to stay with the apartheid regime, we would then 
be ejected from the World Cup. Which South Africa usually gets ejected from the World Cup before sure. we get to the final anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but after 27 years of isolation, we were quite, oh God, you were there too long. <laughs> and uh, so we were quite, you know, we were really engrossed in this 1992 Cricket World Cup. And our big concern was not just winning cricket matches, but all of the second, if the votes go against change in South Africa, we're going to be shipped out. So I think that Inzimam run out was this fantastic photograph of me diving into the wickets, was then used in South Africa, and the tagline was keep jaunty flying. But okay. yes, so, you know, in fact, actually, I spoke to the photographer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Actually, I spoke to the photographer the other day, uh, Jim Fenwick, who's based in Australia and he's still alive. He had just retired two years after that, that photograph, and he was a, a renowned sports photographer in Australia and in Queensland. And uh, that day at the Gabba, so I asked him, because I've never actually spoken to him before. And I think, what, you know, what are you doing? Because in 1992, obviously, no digital cameras. It was all captured on film. You had to send the sort of film back and get it processed. And he just said he was actually focusing on Inzema. And he saw, he kind of was looking through the viewfinder, and he saw something was about to happen. He wasn't sure. So he kept his finger on the, on the trigger, just shooting. And when he got back to develop those particular pictures, he said, while he was focusing on Inzema, the one frame, it was in my hand, the second frame it was the full picture, and the third frame I was gone. And uh, it, it's incredible how I didn't plan it, I never did it again, but one moment of all the training that you do, you do something totally opposite. Um, but it's just because you do put in, because Sandra will tell you, it's a top order basket, if you're facing somebody at 150 k's an hour, your brain doesn't have time to tell you what you want to do. You do it completely on instinct. And that was the key for me, was that whatever I did in the field, it just was, seemed to be the right thing at the right time. So way less about the skill. So the fact that I could run out into my, and that was used, and not just that. I mean, obviously, we were due to change in South Africa. But that was, for me, a really proud moment that it was utilized to ensure that people in South Africa did change from the apartheid regime to a democracy. So yeah, that was my, my big thanks to you. Legendary partnership of 624 runs. I know you've been asked this a uh, million times, but you and your best mate uh, were out there. You, you scored 270 something, 280 something? Yeah, 280 something. Yeah, there you go. So, yeah. would you consider that one of your career highlights, one of your most unforgettable times, or the fact that you do double centuries by the dozen? Nearly, nearly. Um, it, it's a tough one. I've had, I've had innings that I consider are much more important. Uh, that particular uh, game, I think I just come back from from England to uh, when Mahalia just started captaining. We're quite successful to a in, in, in England, and we went back to to Sri Lanka. We started the, the test match, and the SSC usually on the first day and a half, the the ball has something to offer. And in South Africa, though, still, we, we all back first because, you know, it just becomes absolutely flat as ever. Because I think Dale Staines first goal, we had Andre Nell. Um, so South Africa, I think, were all out for maybe just upon 200 or just under. And we went into bat. We lost a couple of wickets. And I had a walk in the bat. in the evening of the, on, on the first day. Not much time there. Um, so I started batting. And Dale Stay pulled an instinct to me, which I was slightly late on. Played the forward defense, hit the inside edge, bounced on the ground, hit my stumps. So I walked off. And then I said, no, 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 don't, don't, don't worry, that's, that's a no ball. <laughs> so I said, okay. Uh, came back uh, to the crease. Dale Stay wasn't happy. Sri Lanka was very hot at the moment. He had to bowl early, he was expecting all fast bowlers in where they didn't sense the batting in sense early because they always say the batsmen need to score 400 runs every time they go out. <laughs> um, so then Mahalo joined me and I remember I hit another cut shot that went straight to Jack Rudolph at cover point but actually I hit it hard enough to get through his hands before so I could have been out twice. Yeah, two lives, not two lives. lives. Two lives, and then finished the day, he went back. Um, and we, we came back the next morning and we just started batting. And 
there was never a conversation at any time about how many runs are we going to get. Even when we, I think it was only when we got like to within five months of the previous record that we thought, oh, a big opportunity to, to break this world record. And everyone asks us what we were talking about during the, during the day when we batted. And every time at the end of an old war, it would spray me, we would talk. And the funniest thing is, 95% of the time, other than those first few overs we faced together, we spoke about everything else but other, but other than everything. Oh, we spoke it. about how oh, are we going to eat tonight, how uh, are we going to do over the weekend, uh, is you know, your family here to watch the game, everything else. Because, you know, what Johnny said earlier about you know, about being, being mindless, this is absolutely essential when you go back. And the only time you think is that in between deliveries or in between overs, when you have a small break, you get your mind off cricket, you relax before you start concentrating again. And the training that you do is just to make sure that it's ingrained in our muscle memory so that when we go out to bat, our body knows if it's full, you drive, if it's wide, you leave, if it's short, you pull, or you duck. And the worst thing is that commentators talk about a thinking batsman when he's facing the ball. That's absolutely wrong. If you're thinking as a batsman, that's the biggest mistake that you can do. You need to absolutely react. And your, your body has to do what the ball tells you to do. The only time you start being meditating is mostly at the back end of a, of a one day, or sometimes in the T20s when you have to try and make the play. Um, and that kind of switching off has really helped me because I hate it that a lot of people say eat, drink, live cricket. Don't do that. In my view, I always tell young cricketers, find another passion, find something else that keeps you interested, that takes your focus off what's happening on the field. So if you get too caught up in what you do as you post field, it's, it's it's really tough to keep fresh and to come back to it. So um, that particular innings for 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 both Mahal and me was significant. It was a bit sad because we broke another Sri Lankan world record between Jai Surya and Mahanama. Um, but we walked out at the end of the day, and it's only when we sat down uh, that, uh, that we understood what we'd done. And the cricket board uh, gave us two cards, you know. Mahanama scored 375, so he got the bigger one. <laughs> <laughs> and I was going to the tiny one, I always tease about it. But uh, yeah, it, was, it was a great feeling uh, to, uh, to be there. Sometimes you need a bit of good fortune. I had two bites at it. Um, so yeah, I was pretty happy with that. You might talk about how you zone out and you don't think you raise your hand, you know, thinking batsman. But now as a coach, as a mentor, how do you how do you advise um, young players to complete you know, like there's pressure of expectation, especially in India, in Sri Lanka too, because uh, Sri Lankan Indians are so passionate about cricket. So how do you tell a, a player to, you know, zone out, zone out of everything else? There could be personal problems at home. There could be things that they could worry about. How do you advise them to just, you know, look at each delivery um, at its merit? Or there could be 35,000 people in Bangladesh. I mean, that's quite difficult to sum it up from. I think the key, and, and something that touched on it very briefly there, uh, was as a coach, I'm way more focused and interested on the process. Because come a game time, like Sandra rightly said, you don't think, and that was my problem. I was premeditating way too often. And add that to a rather hockey style technique, it didn't go down very well um, with my coach and the selective for two years I was dropped. But from a coaching point of view, I'm looking at the process. Because as an ex-player who's drop catches, who's missed balls in the field, I understand that sometimes the ball does go in the light. Sometimes you lose it in the crowd. I'm watching the players. If they drop the ball, if they miss the ball, what was the process? Not only during the game, but what was the process in the build-up to the game? Because you can't guarantee a result. So were they hiding from me at fielding practice? Did I have to go drag them out the dressing room? Or as they were walking past, I would fix them and just spend literally five to ten minutes on doing it at high intensity. Unfortunately, my father, as a young boy, my father taught me with a big stick uh, because he was a principal of a school where you were allowed to give naughty boys a hiding. So at home with three brothers, he would practice that. And what he said was, Johnson, it's not practice makes perfect, I'm afraid to tell you. That's half the story. It's perfect practice that makes perfect. So come here, did you practice?
need to practice hitting three, three lashes at the same line. So if I hit a boy at school, and he goes home to his parents and he complains about Mr. Rhodes, the principal, hit me three times, and the parents go and say, where? There's only one strike. <laughs> so my dad and three brothers, um, yes, we were the, the back end literally of, of his practice, and, and I'm very grateful for that. So that's, that's my focus as a fielding coach in an environment where it is high intensity or where there is high pressure. You have a stick. <laughs> of course I have a very big stick. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> Sometimes you wish you had one. So the key there for me is what is the process because you cannot guarantee the result. Sometimes it's a partnership of over 600, other times it's, it's not a little more, you know, but you put in the same preparation and, and that's the key. So what has been the process in the build up to the game and what is the process, sure. You can make mistakes. Was it pressure? Or was it bad body position? Was it not expecting the ball to come to you? So all those things you look at, and it's not a case of, because you know when you're the fielding coach, and someone puts a catch down, the cameras go to Mrs. Zambani, the big screen is Anita Bobby, looking very strong. Then it comes the next one, it comes to Johnny. And, 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 and then they put the auction price on the top. Yeah. <laughs> When a player drops a catch, um, I'm, I'm more concerned when the ball goes past the player and he doesn't move. That's when I put notes down in my book. So if Mrs. Amari is watching me and the, the catch has just been dropped, I'm only doodling or drawing. And I'm sure that's <laughs> and the player stands there, so I then go to them, okay, the 13 over the fourth ball. Now we'll never know. You see, Charlie, I would never have got it. I said, yeah, but we'll never know. Because you never went for it. So that, that was always my message. If you don't go, you'll never know. So process, 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 and if you don't go for it, we'll never know. And uh, even, even with, 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 when you talk about pressure, it's, it's an absolute constant, and it never goes away. And actually, the more successful you are, the it only builds. Yeah, it only builds. The pressure builds, the expectation builds. And a lot of the time, when you're successful players, and you have had a successful career, and you have always that pressure of expectation. And you have a good average. There's always the danger of you trying to protect that reputation and trying to protect that average. So success can actually breed fear. You don't want to take a risk anymore because they're quite comfortable. You don't want to grow and challenge yourself because you think, well, I've got you doing this, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna keep doing this. Um, but a lot of the times when you're under pressure, the best thing to think about is exactly what John just said. What, did, what is your job? What do I have to do for this particular ball? What is the process if you're a fielder? Watching the ball, reading the state of play, adjusting yourself according to you know the the, the way the batsman's batting, walking up properly, keeping that intensity going forward. For batting, it's the same thing. When you walk out, and all these thoughts are, are, are running through your head. And I remember being in England in 2014, my last tour to England. I've never scored 100 in laws. And every time I went to a press conference, they asked me, "Are you going to score 100 in laws? Your last tour, your last opportunity?" And I kept lying to the press. I said, "No." Nah, who cares? You know, if I score 100 here, I don't. If I do, I do. But inside, I was like, I don't need to So, and I was sitting up in the in the pavilion, and all I could think about sitting up there was how ironic would it be with all these expectations, and I mean, wanting to score 100 so badly that if I walk up there and I get off first ball, right, that's, just, that's all I was thinking. Right. And I, I remember walking through the long room, walking out to the ground, and only when I took my guard, I asked for a mid and leg stump, and I took my guard, that's when I came into focus to think, okay, what do I have to do now? And uh, we used to work with this uh, sports psychologist uh, called Sandy Gordon from the University of Western Australia. And one of the things he stressed in 2007 to us was exactly that. The best way to deal with pressure is just think of your task. What do you have to do? Simplify it and just think of that. The noise dies down, your thoughts just you know, come together and you focus and your performance always builds. More often than not, you perform at your best. In my next life, I'm coming back as Sandra Cora. There are way too much noise in my head. You know, sorry to my we have a few things in common. Not our batting average or our batting technique. Or our ability with the bat or behind the stuff. Junior tennis player, you were? Yeah. That's one. On the Lord's board? Yes. Or a hundred? That's two. 
Honorary Bellis or ACC? What were they? Never decided. Never decided. Never decided. I share one of the front of the car, I think. 27th of October. But there we are. That's, that's as far as the comparisons go. And then let's pose a part of the especially around the battery. That's why we have to. Oh, another one. Gentlemen who are so vastly different from each other, well, also sharing we, their. We, we both own land in Sri Lanka, except my piece of land is as big as that. Two there, two there, two there. It's next to the surf. We did, we did, we did share jumpings together. In, in Sri Lanka, yes. Yeah. Very recently as well. Sorry, but to start, you know, yes. So, um, what is the greatest piece of advice that you've ever got connected to cricket? Words you've lived by, words you've that have just kept coming back at times of adversity? Definitely, definitely from a preparation point of view, was the words from my father that um, it's not practice that makes perfect, but it's perfect practice, so basically practice like you play in a match situation. So I held on to that as a fielder, standing up as a batsman, but as a fielder, my role in the team was to stop the ball going to the boundary. So I saw myself as a goalkeeper. Um, I played the tennis, as I said, as a junior. I played hockey, I played football. As a centre forward, I was always trying to score the goal, so I could see what the goalkeeper was doing to try to keep the ball away. So that advice to me, I picked up most of my injuries in cricket practice. I picked up most of the roasties and the sore elbows, the sore knees at practice. And that stood me in such incredibly good stead throughout my career. And it was as a, as a young boy, so it wasn't a case of, okay, now you've reached international level, now you've got to turn it on or turn it up a notch. I think the reason why out of the blue I was selected for that World Cup squad in 1992, I mean, I really was selected as a fielder um, because my average was even worse than it was at the end of my career at that stage. But it was the fact that my practice was under match situation, match intensity. And that really was something from a schoolboy era that's certainly something that... that you, he is the man responsible for raising the bar in, in the game of cricket. So big round of applause for Jackie Rowe. You know, I don't know how my feeling became good. It became good for like two matches. People used to call me John to say. Thinking some of the subconscious, there's no way he's going to catch it. 
So for me, it, it's, a, it's a great indication of a unit, a strong unit, because they, what they do in the field is not for themselves, but it is for the team. So who do you think currently the best field inside is at this point in time? And where do you think India stands in the whole scheme of things as far as a field inside is concerned? Well, those irritating Australians, unfortunately, <laughs> have always had a very strong team in the field. And, and no surprise, I mean, it's, it's not just because you're a good field and you, you're going to win three consecutive World Cups and then win another one to your two World Cups later. But I think it's always an indication of teams who will be up there. You, you know, you've been in World Cup finals, but you've also had a side where you haven't had to hide too many fielders. And that is the key. Cricket these days, prior to, I don't know, 1999, you could maybe hide three or four players. In, 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 in a 50 over match. Now you can't anymore. I think fielding has certainly been shown that it's such an integral part of the game. It is the third element, and you can't afford to carry too many players with you. So I think Indian well, the Indian team has, has, is so well balanced. I mean, now that Munaf Patel is no longer working with all my Indians <laughs> for India and playing for us, it, it's, been, it's been really interesting because in, in the World Cup in 2015 in Australia, I think South Africa played India at the MCG, and we were outfielded by India. Which is incredible. So I think the IPL, what it has done as a selector, it's a real headache because so many young, talented players have given an opportunity at the IPL to show what they can do. And the second thing is that it's certainly shown everyone, it's stressed to everyone, the importance of fielding. So young, athletic players um, coming through the Indian ranks. So they were right up there. The squad that they have, I'm sure there's a couple of their senior bowlers who are not the fleetest of foot and not going to die around the field. And maybe that's just a generational thing that. You look at the, the young guys coming through, fielding, I mean, it, it's, especially, it's, it's a case of, if you think about fielding again, you won't die. If you die first and think afterwards, you'll have a few injuries and, and the blood will dry and you'll be fine. But if you're worried about, if I hit the ground hard, and it's funny, I mean, I'm now 50, I'm about to be 50 in a few months, I can still die. It's the landing part that's the whole problem. So if I'm to the end of the last it's the actual landing. And I understand what young Indian players go through, because a lot of the facilities they play on, not just gully cricket, is a really hard outfield. So yeah, I think it puts things in perspective. But seeing the young Indian team or the team that they have now, they are, and it's been led from the front. Dhoni himself, when he started, was such a strong and powerful player behind the stunts and with the bats that he certainly started igniting that. You know, if you fit and you, you have to think you can make a difference. Cody's just taking it up another notch. A notch. I mean, players are now left out the team. They can't qualify from a fitness point of view. So it's Suresh Rai and Mati Rai, two really talented players, have been left out specifically because of fitness. So I think that's evident in the way that you feel. 2015 World Cup, we were outfielded by India. So for the South African to you admit that, that's I think a big compliment to the feather in India's cap. <coughs> You're at a vantage point through the game. Why is this a winning combination? How is this a winning combination? It, it, and how much do you enjoy captains? Well, it, 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 I don't think it's a, it's a winning combination at times because it's, it's a lot of stress in terms of, of trying to manage your own competency with the gloves and, and then trying to marshal the field as well. So it has to become habit and you've got to be able to do it time after time and have a bit of experience and practice doing it. And once you get a hang of it, it's, it's really enjoyable because you're always in the game. Um, for me, it, it, it's always about, you know, understanding when I'm captain and understanding that leadership is always situational, so I don't have to, to lead the team all the time. And when I bat, I don't bat as a captain, so there's no captain's innings thinking in my head. I just go back as a batsman because you have to first belong in the team because you're good enough and you have skill to, to be in that team. The only captain, when you're fielding, you have a leadership group, the way you handle yourself on the field, in the dressing room, your, your kind of ethos uh, uh, on the sport, uh, what dressing room culture should be, how the lifestyle of the field should be, what you're playing, all of this counts in terms of being a leader. But you have support in doing it, you have your senior group as well. Uh, the real key is to understand that when you are fielding, that is where you have to make all the decisions. And you can use experience, you can use instinct, you can use feedback from other players, but at the end of the day, you have to make a decision. And once you make a decision, 
it's all about execution because even at times when a lot of the commentators will say, oh, he's made the most, uh, the most terrible mistake in this, it can still work because the execution is good enough to do it. So most of the time I always say, usually in cricket there's no correct or wrong decision. You just have to go out there and make a decision, go out there and try to make it the correct one by executing well. So that's why then comes the whole part of selecting a team. And the whole point is to first get, you know, settle down on the strategy and then pick the 11 players who are going to execute it. Depending on the conditions and the opposition, you can, you can, you can turn it around. And understand that, that trust in your team is a huge part when it comes to competency and skill. Because most of the time, and I've played in sides, and John just spoke about a happy side, and happy side is a, it's, it's, it's a lot to do with first building trust about who walks on the field with you. So you don't want to have any doubts about the guy standing next to you or about yourself as to whether you're ready to go out and compete that day and you're trying to win for your country. So when you walk out, you're not looking at the next guy and thinking, oh, he's here, I like him, he's such a nice guy. I can tell him all my deep and darkest secrets. It's absolutely worthless. What you need to do is look around you and see 10 other people who are absolutely at the peak of their powers, who's prepared as, as well as they as they can, and you're coming on focus to try and win a match. That's what I want to see when I go in. The trust part, in terms of dressing room and off field, you can do it. Uh, so as a captain, it's a lot about engendering leadership in others, and trying to build a team of leaders around you who can think on their own, don't have to come to you, where you can micromanage everything. Uh, and also it's about allowing them to grow and be leaders. If I give Lassie Malik the ball, when we have five runs of defense in the last over, all I have to do is give him the ball. He knows what to do. He has to know what to do. That's why he's there at the side. So I've got to trust him. And he's the sole leader at that point. If I've gone out to bat, I've got to come back in, I can be the captain. I have no control of what happens in the middle when the other two are playing. So you've got to be able to, to engender leadership Make sure that others blossom and take a back seat. You know, your ego doesn't matter. No well, one's ego matters. What's the one thing that Captain C's taught you that you apply the most to real life? It's about, it's, it's, it's a lot to do with, with tolerance. You know, trying to understand that you don't have to like everybody to work with them and to achieve, very a, important point, to yes. achieve a positive That's result. A very important point that you apply to a lot of people here as well. Yes. You are talking about some advice that we received in life. And I think my father was, was very similar to John in, in terms of he was my coach. And he insisted that I did everything, if I spent enough time, or as I said, wasted enough time on doing something, he said you learn better than to do it right. And as well as you possibly can. And he coached me the same way. And even when I was at school over 20 test hundreds, I'd be asleep at night in Australia. And some about two in the morning, I get a call from reception. There's an urgent fax from home. And I, I jump out of bed thinking, something must be wrong. Someone's sick. And then I'd say, who the hell will send a fax if someone was sick? You'll call or you SMS or do something like that. Then I say, oh, it's my father. And I get a little, little note slipped under my door, which was a photocopy page from Bradman's book on batsmanship, with a paragraph on the line saying, please read that before you go to bat tomorrow. And then I actually help you.
story I told. Could you tell it to us? Could you tell it to us in a little bit of a nutshell? Uh, short time. Yeah, 1999, Cricket World Cup. South Africa, semi-final against Australia. You want to remember that? Yeah. Okay. So we didn't lose that game. We tied the match. Now I'm glad I'm sitting next to the, the next president of the NCC, so you change the laws. Because uh, that law didn't really suit us back then, Simon. Um, 2003, we played Sri Lanka and Durban. I'd broken my finger, I was already out of the World Cup squad. So we hosted the World Cup in South Africa in 2003, not for very long, sadly. We didn't get into the second round. Uh, the game against Sri Lanka was the last pool match. They needed one point, I think, to progress to the Super Sixers. We needed two, we needed a win. And the rain came down, Douglas Lewis came out, and South Africa did not read the sheet that gave the score as to tie the game, you need, say, 172 off 27 overs, whatever it was. Mark Boucher, batting with Lance Kuzner, he thought he had got to the 172 or 127, and he defended the last ball, brutally was going. Because you know with Duckworth Lewis, if you lose a wicket, the score is then readjusted. So Mark Boucher hit the winning runs as he thought, and still had one ball to go, which he defended. So much to the Sri Lankans joy, they got their one point, the game was tied, and we as South Africans were exiting our own World Cup in 2003, didn't even get to the second round. So that was one run again, where one run would have got us through, not to win the World Cup, but certainly to the next stage. Then the match where South Africa played against Australia, Johannesburg. Australia broke a world record and scored 434 in a one-day game. Now this, to put things in context, was to win the series. It was two all in the series, a five-game five one-day series. Ricky Ponting had missed the first two games because of a broken thumb. He came back for Australia. They won game three and game four. So now game five in Johannesburg, 434, Australia batted first and scored that record score. Obviously, he's never been chased down before. And now I'm the sponsorship manager for Standard Bank. So I've been the whole time thinking I'm going to give the trophy to Graham Smith, my friend, and I'm going to give it to Ricky Ponting, who wasn't my friend at that stage. We have all a partnership as a whole. At the end of the innings, an incredible look. Herschel Gibbs scored 175, Graham Smith got 90 on and uh, it came down to the last over, where Brett Lee was bowling. And we were already eight wickets down, but requiring six strikes. Mark Boucher on the non strike is in at 40 odd, I think about 47. And Andrew Hall was batting with him. So Ricky Ponting didn't want to allow Andrew Hall to get a single with six runs required. And Mark Boucher was on the non strike is in. So Ricky Ponting brought in all the fielders to try and prevent the single. Andrew Hall's a decent all rounder, and he managed to strike the first ball of the over for four. So now suddenly, South Africa, because we, just, we were hitting boundary six at boundary out, boundary, so the whole game was incredible, and came down to the last over, and it looked like we were going to be two runs short, because up to the crease walked Mackay and Team, our number 11 batsman. Well, he wasn't number 11 batsman, he was just number 11. You get some number 11 batsman, and he was just number 11. Anyway, so fortunately for us, because Bradley is now bowling at the prime of his career, so between 145 and 150, and it's reverse swinging because Herschel gets to hit the ball into the stadium all day. So that cooker boat has been injured badly and it's scuffed and it's reverse swinging at 145. Fortunately, the guy is a little bit afraid, so he backs away towards short leg and Brett Lee fires in the almost perfect Yorker to leg stump. But because Makaya had backed away so far, he says he glided the ball to third leg. <laughs> now, I got dropped from test cricket for two years because I had a problem with the outside edge. So I know an outside edge when I see one. So anyway, now as the, as the uh, sponsorship manager for Standard Bank, I was there with all the dignitaries at the prize giving ceremony, but I've asked not just to sit on the stage or stand on the stage, um, let me just stand with the players and I'll hand the trophy over. And I'm leaning on Makai, or he's leaning on me, he's quite tall, and Makai T has got the biggest smile on his face. I said to Makai, what are you smiling about? You bowled your 10 overs for about 90 runs today. <laughs> Bad day at the office. And then he just looks at me and goes, hey, but Jojo, Call me Jojo. Without my one run. <laughs> we lose the game. I said, what do you mean? Without your one. He said, no, you're 175. Grant Smith, 90. He says, yeah, but without my one, we lose. <laughs> and he was so right. And that's, you talk about my philosophies as a fielding coach. I just ask each player, save me one run. Because if you think about an IPL game, super overs, I mean, the last over is generally. It's so tight, and if every player saves me one run, that's an incredible opportunity for us to win the game. So 
434 seemed impossible. And it was an incredible game. But the one run made all the difference. And that's so true with, you know, in South Africa, we're a third world economy. In India, it's an economy that certainly is never went through much of the dips that a lot of the economies went through from a recession point of view. But there's 1.2 or 3 billion people here. And the danger with that, or an organization that is global, the danger with that is you can sit here as a part of a team, or as a part of a country or community, and say, what is the point of me getting up and actually doing something? Picking up the litter and putting it in the dustbin. Or staying in my lane when I'm driving. I mean, I don't understand that. There's just no lane discipline whatsoever. Because <laughs> everybody else is not staying in the lane. Everybody else is throwing their litter down. And I'm here to remind you and encourage you to say that one run, your individual contribution, whether it's in your organization, in your communities, in this country, your vote, your, whatever you are doing, will make a difference and allow the team, the organization, the community, the country to achieve this goal. Surfboard next to my closet. Does that count? Okay, fine. Okay. Everything in your closet is your surfboard. 
Describe uh, yourself as a teenager in three words. I was shocked. I can't use it pretty, so I said I was stupid. Three words, not three words, not just one. I was oh, stupid. I was stupid. <laughs> Growing up in Candy, which was asleep after six o'clock in the evening, there was nothing to do. A lot of stupid things that we did as teenagers. Okay. Describe yourself today in three words. I am stupid. <laughs> Yeah. Gentlemen over here, can we have a mic here to you, please? Oh, all right. Okay. 
Okay. First of all, thank you to HP for organizing this session and having uh, both of you guys over here. My luck's good with uh, South Africa, probably because I've caught uh, Gary at the airport once and now I see Jyanti. So thanks. Uh, so this question is for Kumar. Do you believe uh, in zodiac signs? Because you seem to be born on 27th of October. I'm on 29th of October. So how do you relate your <laughs> cricketing skills with your zodiac signs? from another mother. <laughs> uh, no, I, 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 don't, I don't read the, the, the newspapers. I have a horoscope. And my father told me when I was very young that he had more horror than school. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I have a question to the audience. Uh, this is where the QA comes to an end. A big thank you to the two gentlemen on stage. Thank you very much.